Well, good afternoon or good morning, whatever your case may be. We're now still in the third time period, and it's going to be our fourth session that we have together. And Lord willing, we'll be looking at chapters 10, 11, 12, and just get into a little bit of 13 on the Antichrist in today's study. <clears throat> We're at the midpoint of the tribulation period, and uh, we are going to go down a rabbit trail today like we did last time with the giants and the Nephilim, but our rabbit trail today is going to take us on a little journey that I trust that all of you are the Bereans, that you will search these things out in the scriptures and uh, see if they would be able to connect some dots for you. It did me. <clears throat> At the midpoint of the tribulation, we're going to come to what I call a time of of a holy pause, if you please. We see where we're at. We've gone through the church age. We've seen the rapture, the marriage supper of the Lamb, the judgment seat of Christ. And these arrows right here, we'll be looking at today. We've looked at the seals and most of the trumpets. And at the sounding of the seventh trumpet today, we're going to go on a rabbit trail. We have seen the preaching of the 144,000. And we're going to see two more join them today, uh, even though they're mentioned later on in Revelation 11. We're going to see that along with the 144,000, these two witnesses preached for the first 1260 days or three and a half years to the midpoint of the tribulation period. <clears throat> So like we said, sometimes we go back to the bare basics. This is the cross, the church age, and now we have the tribulation, seven years called Jacob's Trouble, and we're right at the midpoint today. And then we're going to have the second coming of Christ, the setup of the millennium, the last judgment, and then home, sweet home. Chapter 10. Again, as we go through this, we're going to be reading some scripture today, and we would really appreciate if you would have your Bibles open. It's kind of like we're having a pause here. It's like there's a seven-gun salute from the Savior, and he's just saying, it's going to be all right. Sun's still shining. He's still on the throne. Everything's going to be good. And even though the earth is shaking, our Savior is not. And we're going to see a picture of that today. So open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 10. I'll read the first four verses. And I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud with a rainbow over his head, and his face was like that of the sun, and his legs were like pillars of fire. He had a little scroll open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea, and his left foot on the land, and he called out with a loud voice like a roaring lion. And when he called out the seven thunders and sounded, I was about to write, Do not write it down. Christ, <clears throat> I'm going to call this picture a picture of the Lord. After everything that has been unveiled through the first three and a half years, the unveiling, the unveiling, the apocalypsis, for some reason here, the Bible says, John, I don't want you to write these things down. And I want to pause right here for a little bit thinking about that. Don't write these things down. I think this is a picture of the Lord here. And the reason I say that, some call him the Archangel Gabriel, and that's fine. But I would suggest, as you look at the scripture here, said he's wearing a cloud, and it's kind of like the transfiguration when he wore a cloud there and and back in Exodus even, 13. 
Bible says he's crowned with a rainbow and his face is shining like the sun. Sounds just like Malachi chapter four. And then it says that his feet are on fire. And back in Revelation 1 and 15, it says the same thing as it shows a picture of Christ. So I think the Lord is here and he's having this holy pause and he's telling John, do not write these things down. So the first thing we do is we say, um, what things? <laughs> well, we don't know. John never wrote it down. And folks, there's a lesson here. I think it's probably good a lot of times in our life that it's a blessing for us not to know. And why do we say that? Not knowing some things in life will keep a man or a woman very humble. Sometimes it's pretty hard to be around somebody that is a know-it-all. And I think you know what I mean. But John is not going to write this down. And the Bible says in Deuteronomy 29 and 29 that the secret things, they belong to the Lord. But the things that are revealed, they belong to us. And so what is revealed to us? The Word of God. But there are some things we're never going to know. And because of that, I think it keeps us humble. I think also that not knowing will keep you and I active with our gifts. If we knew everything, we might become slack with the things that God has blessed us with. <clears throat> he says in Romans 11 and 29 that the gifts and the calling of God, they're without repentance. He's not going to change his mind and he wants you and I to, to strive to lift him up to glorify the Father with our bodies as a living sacrifice. And I think, thirdly, that not knowing everything always keeps us, what? Leaning and trusting in Him. That's what the Bible says in Proverbs 3. Trust in the Lord with all of your own heart and don't lean on your own understanding. We don't know everything. And so the Lord Jesus Christ Himself is the one that told John here, do not write this down. But then he tells John something kind of interesting. He says in verse 9, John, I want you to take this scroll here and I want you to eat this scroll. And he did. The Bible says here that it was very, very bitter. So what is this saying to us? Well, the Bible says in I believe in Psalm 34 that we are to taste the Lord and see that he is good. And I think every time we, we eat and we taste the word of God, it's, it's sweet to your spirit. It's sweet to your soul. And, and yet the experiences then are sometimes very bitter that we go through. I think John seen that here. Think about your love and the passion that you have for your Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet we know as we live for Him, as we stand for Him, as we live and do what He tells us to do, we face what? Well, we face trials and persecution. But the Bible says that all those that are going to live godly in Christ Jesus, we're going to suffer persecution. And John seen that as he ate this scroll. I love the way he said it here. Eat the whole book. Not three pages. Not ten pages. The whole book. Folks, don't eat three pages. Don't eat four chapters. It's a blessing when we read the whole book. And the reason I'm saying that is, is Man tendency to go from Genesis to Jude and stays away from the book of Revelation. 
And right in the beginning of the book of Revelation, it says, he that reads and understands, it is a blessing to read the book, the entire book. So as we take the Bible, we are to eat the whole word because it is a blessing, even though life can be bitter. Chapter 11. Well, as you walk into chapter 11, I want to read verses uh, 3, 7, and 9, or maybe 3, 5, 7, and 9, uh, if you have your Bibles open. Verse 3, it says, <clears throat> I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy for 1,260 days, clothed in sackcloth. 5. And if anyone should harm them, fire will pour out of their mouths and consume all of their foes. Now go down to verse 7. And when they finish their testimony of preaching, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit, the Antichrist, will make war on them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the streets, well, in Jerusalem, in the city where their Lord was crucified, verse 9. And for three and one half days, people will gaze at their bodies, their dead bodies. Verse 11, but after three and a half days, they will receive the breath of life from God and stand up alive again. Well, there's a big question about who these two witnesses are and I'm going to suggest that it's going to be Moses and Elijah. The reason we say that is Moses represents the law and Elijah represents the prophets. So when you hear the the word of God talking about the law and the prophets, you're looking at two of the greatest witnesses. Chapter 11 in the book of Revelation, I have found this even as we have studied it is probably the most difficult chapter to speak on. And the reason is, there is so much debate and controversy over this chapter. Most people say this is just symbolic. A lot of people will argue that it's just a spiritual lesson. It's not literal people. And yet those are, are those that take it literally, and as we do. And so I will call this Moses and Elijah. Three things we want to make clear as we walk through a little bit here of chapter 11. This is about the Jews. Moses and Elijah is about the Jew. Call it a Zionist movement if you want. This is not the body of Christ. We are in heaven. We have been raptured. And in the middle of the week, when these two are finally killed, they have been preaching for 1,260 days. And they have been clothed in sackcloth. So they have been preaching along with the 144,000 of the tribes. And they're preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And not only is the two witnesses a, a Zionist movement, These two witnesses, it's a prophetic statement. Why do we say that? Because in the beginning of the chapter, it says that they were given a rod and they measured the temple. That temple is not built yet. That temple is going to be built immediately either after the rapture or after the signing of the covenant with the Jew. But it's going to be built. It's going to be built. And I think that's why it says a prophetic statement. And it goes on to say there in this same chapter that when these two die in the streets, 7,000 will come and make a party and a holiday out of it. And if anybody tries to bother them during that time before they're dead, fire will proceed from their mouths And it says in verse 5, it will devour their enemies. 
A lot of power given to Moses and Elijah here. And I have found through the word of God, and I know you have too, that, that God never leaves his people anywhere without a witness. You can go down through the word. You can look at Noah and Enoch, Elisha and Elijah, Paul and Silas. The disciples were sent out two by two. You got Joshua and Caleb, Titus and Timothy, and you got Moses and Elijah. You remember, they were there with Christ at the Mount of Transfiguration. And here they are. They're going to be lying now in the streets, the Bible says. And the Antichrist is going to create a national holiday. And why do we say that? Well, the Bible says there's a time of gifts and parties and presents when they're laying there. And then to the horror of all the world, of all the major news networks, right when the Antichrist and everybody is gleefully glad that these two preachers are killed, they're going to rise again. And I want you to imagine an Anderson Cooper or a Lemon or an Adam Schiff all excited about these believers and these preachers taken away. And then they come out and stand up to life. And the great joy turns to a great fear. Wow. I want to give you a little thought here. I know that in seclusion and the times that we're kind of in our homes a lot, we get cabin fever. Sometimes people have been saying they've been getting very depressed and life has become as stagnant and stale. I want you to take the lesson of Moses to Elijah. You want to get oof back into your life? Then become a witness. A witness for him. And folks, you can do it from your home. You can do it on a telephone. You can do it on a call. You can do it in a text. But be a witness for him. And then you'll find that life is not stagnant or boring anymore. Revelation 11, the seventh trumpet finally sounds. <laughs> we had that little lull and a time where Christ, in that parenthetical phrase, said, I'm still on the throne, everything is fine. And now we walk into chapter 11, verse 15, and we read these words. And the seventh trumpet sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of this world are becoming the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Verse 19. And there were flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder and earthquake and heavy hail. What do we do with the seventh trumpet? Well, I'm going to take you down another rabbit trail. I know last week we went down a rabbit trail and we looked at the giants and the Nephilim. Today's rabbit trail is, I'm going to call it a critical thinking challenge. And folks, I want you to know this. This is going to be my opinion. I want you to challenge everything we're going to be saying here on this rabbit trail Challenge it with scripture. It's what it says in Acts. And this rabbit trail is probably going to take us a few moments or minutes. <clears throat> but I'm going to tell you why we're going to go down it. For years, as we've read um, about Christ during the death, the burial, the resurrection of our Savior and the time he was on the cross, there were things that always kind of I wondered about, I was bothered about. One of them was, is it said that there was darkness for three hours. And I'm not an astronomer, but I do know enough that there's no eclipse, solar eclipse that lasts longer than seven minutes and 12 seconds. And lunar eclipses are even less. 
And I bumped into a man in Australia. He's a, a, an astronomer. I trust him, and he's a Christian man. His name is Gil Broussard. So a lot of these things I'm going to share with you are some of the slides and photos I got from him. But I want you to think with me about this seventh trumpet. If you remember back in the third trumpet, the Bible says that a big star actually named it, called Wormwood. And the sixth to the seventh trumpet, all of these things were happening. Stars from heaven, great earthquake, Wormwood slamming into planet Earth. I take that literal. It said a third of this vegetation that wiped out so much of the planet. So what do we do on this rabbit trail with that? I think it's a miracle. All of these are God allowing this to happen. God working the miracle. But I think explaining a miracle does not make it less a miracle. And I'm going to offer a suggestion on this rabbit trail to show you what happened maybe to this earth and how it happened. It's a miracle, but the miracle is in the timing. It's in the timing. Miracles. Explaining a miracle does not make it less a miracle. Look at this right here. Man today, doctors can describe how life is formed in the womb, but we can't even create a rose. Life is still a miracle. And even though a lot of this can be explained, the miracle is still in the hands of the Lord, still a miracle. We can describe how water is turned into wine through fermentation. It takes time. But we can't do it at a wedding no one ever has or any kind of a party. But explaining the miracle does not make it less a miracle. I want to try to maybe explain or open up some thought of this miracle that took place of the blowing of the third, the fifth, the sixth, up to the seventh trumpet. Genesis chapter 7, 11 and 24. In the 600th year of Noah's life, all the fountains of the deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were opened and the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. The Bible is saying here, something broke apart in the heavens and something broke apart in the deep areas of the earth. So what happens here? The fountains of the deep were broken up and the windows of the heavens were open and it all took place in 150 days. I want you to keep that in the back of your mind. There is no detail in the word of God that is extraneous. Everything mentioned in this Bible is relevant, especially when it's mentioned twice. 150 days is not mentioned again until the book of Revelation. We read it in the blowing of the trumpets. Remember when the bad guys were coming out of the earth? Nephilim? Keep that in mind. The canopy of the waters was ruptured from above when there was a slamming or the coming of this wormwood. The earth crust was ruptured from below. 150 days later, the waters receded. How is that even possible? Well, we know it's a miracle. But I want to suggest that there was a planet, we're going to call it Planet X. I Google it again today, NASA they admitted it back in 79 and 83, and now they're trying to cover it up and saying there's no such thing. But in 1983, the Washington Post wrote about Planet X. They sent out Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 to explore this 
weird star, something out there that was causing Uranus and Neptune to a little go a little off track. <clears throat> 2012, National Geographic wrote about the strange planet X. 2013, the Vatican, Rome, Roman Catholicism revealed of their one of the largest telescopes on the planet. It's an infrared telescope. They've named it Lucifer. You can Google it. Lucifer, Lucifer means the day star. They are looking for this planet X, the day star. We would like to suggest, here's the sun right here, first fly by to the earth because this planet X is in its own elliptical orbit. It's come by and I would suggest it flew by in Noah's time here and it's going to fly by again somewhere in the coming days. First fly by, there was a release from this planet, an asteroid or things that broke up the canopy of the waters in the heavens. It goes around the sun 150 days later, second flyby, a big chunk comes off and slams into the planet. First flyby is, fly by is a meteor storm. Second flyby is an asteroid. What's the difference between the two? Well, an asteroid is nothing more than a large rock or a hunk of metal. A meteorite or a meteor shower storm is small particles. You see that in the comments. Smaller size. So the first flyby of planet X breaks up the canopy of the heavens, the waters. Second flyby, the asteroid slams into the planet, which would be wormwood. Everything changes. Cross Earth's orbit two times in 150 days. So let's go through this real simple. First flyby at the second pass over 3000 BC in the day of Noah, a meteor storm ruptures the Earth canopy of water. There was no seasons. The Bible says that the earth was like a hothouse effect the time of Adam and Eve. No seasons pre-flood. No mountains. So here you have slamming in to this canopy of water and it shattered the upper firmament of water. That opened the floodgates of heaven. The second flyby, 150 days later, Planet X dry, drags, uh, we would suggest, a 110-mile-wide asteroid into a collision course with Earth. Water's above, water's beneath. The whole Earth is flooded at this time, and this asteroid slams into the planet. So think. The miracle may be in the timing, but it doesn't make it less a miracle. First pass breaks up the canopy of heavens. Second pass breaks up the fountains of the deep. So here's our critical thinking challenge. From the third, the sixth, and the seventh trumpet, planet X in Noah's day, called Wormwood, in Revelation, when it comes back again, is going to slam into the earth 23.5 degrees or 44 degrees and put it back on its axis again. I think that the slamming of that asteroid back there the day of Noah, the whole world was filled with water, and they said, well, if an asteroid of that size would hit the world, the earth, it'd burn up. No, it was covered with water in that first 150 days, and water's a great conductor of heat. It slammed into the planet, and it radically changed the topography of the earth. Earth change. Remember the 150 days? 
And we get that from the Jewish calendar, 30 days in a month. They were tormented for five months. This earth was tormented for 150 days from the first meteorites to the asteroid slammed on the planet. Now you've got people here in Revelation after this trumpet saying, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms for our Lord Jesus Christ. They thought he was coming back right then. But he's got seven more bowls of wrath to pour out. And the world at this point is changing back to pre-flood, no 23 degree tilt, no more seasons, back to hot house effect, all in line for the millennium. And you can study that on your own. Sun will be seven times hotter, moon seven times brighter. <clears throat> and then I found this scripture in Isaiah 24. The Lord will distort its surface, the earth, and scatter abroad its inhabitants. The earth is violent, broken, is split open, and is shaken exceedingly, and shall totter, tilt, like a hut. Folks, so often the miracle is in the timing. You remember where I said I used to wonder about the crucifixion? At the crucifixion of Christ in Luke 23, there was darkness from the sixth to the ninth hour, and there was a great earthquake. I would suggest that this planet was making another elliptical orbit at the time of Christ. <clears throat> Maybe back in Joshua's day, but that three-hour eclipse had to be something else. But if you have something seven times the size of the earth, go between the sun and the earth, it'd be three hours exactly with a flyby. Three hour eclipse. And you go back and make a study in Joshua's long day, you see the same thing could have happened. Nibiru, and I'm sorry I put that in there, it's not, I should have just put Planet X. Between the earth and the sun, it could have looked like this in Noah's day. The planet getting that big. If it starts to come back in another 10 or 15 years or whenever God does this wormwood. Bible says in Luke, the men's hearts are going to be failing in a fear. Why? What they're seeing in the heavens. You see a big thing like that coming. Your heart might fail with fear too. Scientists suggest 110 miles in diameter asteroid would be able to be enough to tilt the Earth's axis. 110 miles width would be a, a big rock as big as from here to San Francisco. That's big. And these asteroids, they travel at a, a, a speed of 28,000 miles an hour. Let's say Wormwood is coming at this planet at 28,000 miles an hour and it slams into it. Scientists say that that's enough to tilt the earth. And here's what I find fascinating. Even the giants that we looked at last week or the Nephilim, they knew of planet X. They have found in the Sumerian uh, caverns 4,500 years ago before there were telescopes before there was Hubble telescopes before you could just through the naked eye a few stars on the walls 4,500 years ago there is a picture of all the planets Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus Neptune Pluto was be considered a dwarf now, but the ninth planet, planet X, they had it way out here. How'd they know that? Well, that's where they came from. Nepha means fallen one. And there they were. They'd already witnessed that planet from heaven. 
So there's a question that we remain on this rabbit trail and is probably going through your mind right now. Is there any evidence of such an impact on our planet ever in the past? Anywhere with this size or magnitude of a wormwood or of an asteroid hitting the planet and tilting it on its axis. Well, folks, most truths are staring at us right in the face. This is a suggestion where it may have hit in Noah's day. And Gil Broussard, through NASA satellites, these are pictures of the Gulf, 80% of our oil in the Gulf comes from this area right here. Organic material built, buried suddenly. And look at the visible landslide after the asteroid would hit here, a 1,400, 1,500 mile radius. They say that that impact is about what it would be, 10 times the size of the rock itself would create 10 times the size of the creator. So, it made about a 1,200 mile circle after the slamming of the asteroid. And that's where so much of our oil comes from. Oil wells, since the last 68 years, drilled in the Gulf, there's 4,500 of them in the Gulf. And again, it's just, where does it come from? Organic material buried suddenly in fact, all the oil that we see is a proof of the flood. Organic material buried suddenly. And that's why so much of our oil comes from the Middle East. It's where our population and growth was then. And the result of the impact, I love this, from the Gulf exactly on the other side, if you have a globe at home, look at the Gulf, of Mexico and then go on the opposite side of the globe and look at the same impact, 12 to 1300 miles shock wave on the other side of the planet, the Himalayan. China, Nepal, India, I think that's Pakistan up here. And that impact that may have hit in the Gulf rose these mountains that were not here in Noah's day. Created in a matter, I need another T in there, of seconds. The Himalayan mountains. And they were all a result of the changes during and right after the flood. So let's summarize that rabbit trail. The miracles of these trumpets is in the timing. First flyby broke up the can canopy of heavens and the fountains of the deep from the gravity pull. Second flyby, a trailing asteroid slams into the earth, wormwood, and causes the earth to tilt on its axis again. Well, what about the heat? Well, like we said, the earth was entirely covered with water at the time, and it absorbed the heat. And the miracle is in the timing. And I would suggest that something of of this will probably be taking place during the trumpets, judgments, and revelation. Back from the rabbit trail. <laughs> the woman, the war, and the woe. <clears throat> and by the way, as you look at that rabbit trail, I'd encourage you, go to Scripture, go to Genesis, go to the 150 days, look at all of these things up and, and just see the miracle may be all in the timing. <clears throat> Chapter 12. <clears throat> Verse 1, And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was pregnant, crying out in birth pains, and the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven, behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his head seven diadems. 
His tail swept along or down a third of the stars from heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman about to give birth so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child, one who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled to the wilderness for 1,260 days. Great sign in heaven. A lot of speculation about this woman. Well, I think we got a picture here of the beginning of God finally unmasking the beast or Satan. And he has been caught up with trying to take away God and the influence of God and his son Christ for 6,000 years. It has been a battle, and Galatians puts it so well, flesh against the spirit, spirit against the flesh. It's a battle, it's a war. And he's about ready to go to war in heaven, and we'll see that. And he's going to be losing the war, and it says a third of them are going to be cast down. Wow. And just as there has been a scarlet thread of redemption from the book of Genesis to the Revelation, there's also been a diabolical black line of the devil in the same amount of years. He has always wanted to eradicate anybody that talked about God or worship God. He has always wanted to destroy all of God's plans and for you and I and the body of Christ to be hindered in any area that he could do it. He's tried to destroy the word of God and he's failed miserably. He has an insidious attitude to be adored by the world. He wants to be worshipped by the masses. He wants to do it desperately, as you read here, to destroy the seed of the woman, which is Christ. I've had one of the roughest weeks, and I knew it was going to happen. Anytime I ever speak about the devil, the dragon, the beast, the Antichrist, or hell, I have a, a war going on in my thought life and even other areas. Sometimes I dread bringing up the subject. And it's going to happen next week as we get into more of the Antichrist. The devil does not like to be put down. This woman here, many will call Mary, is not, it's not Mary. It's not Mother Teresa. <laughs> the woman is the nation of Israel. And Christ is the child, the one that will come to rule the nations with a rod of iron. And he is resurrected today. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He's in the throne room today. He is our advocate. He is our intercessor. And during this time, the Bible says, when he's trying to do everything he can to destroy Israel, to destroy God, to destroy the body of Christ, the church has been raptured in heaven. He is madder than ever. God says, it's time for you to go. Verses 7 through 9 says, Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. Look at verse 7. Chapter 12, now war rose in heaven and Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was defeated and there was no longer any place left for them in heaven. The great dragon was thrown down the ancient serpent, serpent, who is called the devil and Satan and the deceiver of the earth. 
Satan loses. And why is the Bible saying here in chapter 12 that there's a war in heaven? I want you to study this. I want you to think about this with me. It'll sound strange when I say it. But in heaven is where sin originated. In this sense. Sin started in the heart of Lucifer, the anointed one, the, the highest of God's created angels. And Lucifer was there in heaven when he said these words in Ezekiel, I will be like the most high. The five I wills, you read it. And for 6,000 years, Satan has had access to the throne room. Go look in Hebrews where it says, he is the accuser even today of the brethren. When you and I sin, he's right there. Look what Gordon did. And Christ said he's covered by the blood. But here he is cast out. You remember Job chapter 1 verse 9 where it says the sons of God came to present themselves and Satan was with them. Every time you see the sons of God, like in Genesis, that's the fallen ones. Still in heaven, but not here. In the middle of the tribulation period, there's going to be a war and he's going to be cast out to earth and God will pour out his final wrath on man. And when Satan is cast out and he realizes he's lose, losing big time, then it really gets bad here. And we're going to see it in the next few sessions. Of planet 12. Notice the cheer in verse 11. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb. And by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. Wow. It is really tough. And God gives us the grace. Don't shy away from studying the word of God. We don't seem like we hear the word hell much anymore, or Antichrist, or even the devil and Lucifer. But he's real. But God is in control. Now we walk into chapter 13. We're still right in the middle of the book. And I want you to open your Bibles to chapter 13. I'm going to read a couple of verses here. <clears throat> We're now just going to have a little bit of an introduction to the Antichrist. Next session, we'll look at him more in depth and some of the other um, bold judgments. <clears throat> Verse 1, and I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns, ten heads, ten diadems on its horns, and blasphemous names on its heads. And they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? And who can fight against him? There he is. And Jesus, you remember, said in John 4, 5, 43, I came in my Father's name, and you did not receive me. Another will come in his name, and him you will receive. You see, from the beginning of time, clear back in there in the Old Testament days, back in Nimrod's time, man has always dreamed of becoming a ruler of the planet. And we've seen him down over the years. Nimrod and Pharaoh and Nebuchadnezzar and Stalin and Hitler and Napoleon and Alexander the Great and Saddam Hussein and you can go on and on. Well, when this man comes on the scene, the Bible said that the world will begin to wonder after him. Now I want you to notice here, three of the great world religions today all have prophecies concerning a wicked world leader 
at the end of the age or the end of times. The Muslims or the Islamic group, they have Dajjal, a one-eyed man of intense evil and hatred, or you could call him the 12th Imam or the Mahdi. Judaism, a Roman ruler called Armilius, who is killed by their coming Messiah. And Christianity has the Antichrist. <clears throat> Bible says when this beast comes out of the sea, he's going to be represented by a lot of factors. I find it very interesting that if you don't know the Old Testament and all you do is look at the book of Revelation, it's going to be very hard to understand the book. You read the book of Daniel, from Daniel 7 to Daniel 12, it is a map, again, of the book of Revelation. Read the book of Joel, read Hosea, read Zechariah. And in a lot of these areas, you're going to see the factors of this beast out of the sea. So what factors will identify this man? Well, the Bible says in Daniel 8, 19, he will rise to power in the last days. He's going to rise to power and come on the scene right after the rapture. We've seen that in the riding of the white horse. He will rule the entire world. The Bible said that in Revelation 13. He will rule by deception. It says that in Daniel 8. He will be extremely very intelligent, again, in the book of Daniel, Old Testament. He will come to control the global economies of the earth. We'll see that next week. He will be assisted by the false prophet. We'll see him next week. He will break a treaty with Israel. Daniel 9 said he's going to sign a covenant with a Jew for one week. In the middle of the week, he breaks the covenant and says, I'm God. It's called the abomination of desolation. We'll see that next week. <clears throat> he will claim to be God, says that in Thessalonians. He will fake a death and the resurrection. We'll see that next week. He's a copycat. Christ was crucified. Christ died, rose again. He's going to do the same thing. But it's fake. And he will have Jewish blood in his veins. Why do we say that? Again, you look in the book of Daniel, chapter 11, says that he forsook the faith of his fathers. That is always a Jewish terminology. So somewhere, this man is probably alive today, but he forsook the faith of his fathers. He hates the Jew, and he's mad. Maybe living right now. And I love the contrast of Christ and the Antichrist. Christ is from above. The Bible says in John 6 and 38, the Antichrist is from below. Christ humbled himself. The Antichrist, everything he does, you read the book of Daniel, he exalts himself. Christ was despised, rejected of men. The Antichrist is going to be admired and popular. Christ is a man of sorrows. The Antichrist is a man of sin. Christ came to seek and to save. Antichrist comes to deceive and destroy and to kill. Christ is full of love. The Antichrist is full of evil and sin. Christ is worshipped by millions. The Antichrist will be worshipped by billions. Like father, like son. We're going to kind of clip it off there today, next week, Lord willing, and uh, be praying for us. I do not like to study this man, but we're going to look at the rising of the beast. We're going to look at the ruling of the beast and how he rules. We're going to look at the railing of the beast on people, and we're going to look at his sidekick, the false prophet, and then we're going to open up the final seven Super Bowl judgments 
I'm not sure how far we'll get through it, but we're going to do, be doing that in the fourth time period. Folks, who's coming back? It amazes me as we look at the news and watch the headlines even today that we know it's close. We, we're seeing the signs of the time. And next week, we're going to be looking at the mark of the beast. And wow, I was just hearing today again about this ID 2020. This ID that they're wanting to make into a chip or something, the tattoo on us. To, you can't do anything unless you got ID'd with a 2020. We're going to be a part of the signs of the time. And as logical as it may sound, it's all marching towards the beast. He's coming soon. So I would encourage all of us to have a healthy balance of expectation and participation. Expect the Lord to be coming back at any moment. We should have a greater fervency to share others about his return as we ever have. But during the time, make sure that we're still participating. Don't sit back and just wait for him to come. Participate. Run with patience, not from responsibilities. We know we're going to have troubles and things like this. But the Bible says in, in Romans 12, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, and be constant in prayer. And we can do that. Don't run from our responsibilities. Have a steady intake of the word as you look for the uptake or the rapture. I get this question a lot. Well, how much intake should I read the Bible? As much as you can. I'll tell you what we started quite a few years back. I think some of you we shared this with. I eat about three times a day. Lately, we've been trying to go to two times. But most of my life, I ate three times a day. I added it up. And the average is I eat about 20 to 23 minutes every day. I don't let a day go by if I can that I do not at least read 23 minutes of the Word of God every day. The Bible says in Ephesians that we're to feed the inner man. Folks, you can see that we really do good feeding the outer man. How much are you feeding the inner man? The Bible says he needs to be strengthened day by day. So make sure you have a steady intake of the Word of God and more especially in the times we're living in. The Bible says that in Hebrews as we see the day approaching. And then be on guard for anyone that tries to diminish the Lord Jesus Christ. I think the devil is ramping the demonic warfare up. He'll do everything he can. Right now he's gleefully thinks, I've got them out of their churches. All we are is church scattered. Someday soon, I hope it's church gathered again. But in the meantime, and it gets pretty mean, we're going to be church scattered for a while. But we still are the body of Christ to lift him up in every way that we can. I know some of you are, are having a tough time right now. Some of you, even in your laughter, the Bible says that even in your laughter, your heart may ache. Just stay true to him. Stay in the word, stay fervent in prayer. And the Lord will bless you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this little season of fellowship today as we looked again at the third time period, fourth session. And as we scratched around, we probably created a lot more questions and gave answers. And I think that's good. We just pray that everybody will continue to study the word of God and seek out truth. Father, forgive us if there's anything I said that is in error. Well, we ask for forgiveness. We know your word has no error. Bless our time, bless our week. And Father, we are looking forward to your return. 
In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Have a great week.